Once again to airfields in Lincolnshire, three years after the war come American super fortresses with guns loaded and manned. The great war planes sidle in as if aware of their own significance at this grave time in the diplomacy of the Western Allies. The RAF is there to welcome them. At Scampton, the disembarking crews are greeted by Air Vice Marshal Guest. As one after the other, the mighty B-29s line up. The world is told that 60 superforts have come to Britain as part of normal long-range training routine. Many members of the crews saw wartime service from these same airfields. Their planes, however, are post-war advances on the types which carried atom bombs over Japan. By an odd coincidence, Harwell's atomic research station receives a public airing. Here, the British press, watched closely by security police, is given some opportunity to record Britain's atomic development. Even leading scientists like Sir John Cockcroft do not escape close scrutiny. With Professors Blackett and Coburn, Sir John provides most of the material for the photographers. What is housed in many of the buildings remains a closely guarded secret. The scientists pose before a cyclotron which generates a 200 million volt stream of atomic particles. Another of their tools is the giant Van de Graaff high voltage generator. It produces up to 5 million volts to speed the particles of the atomic nuclei. Here, man's ingenuity can harness the forces of the universe for good or evil. It remains for man to choose. And none can know at the present time which way the decision lies. It is to the world's great figures that the eyes of all are turned as events march forward in striking resemblance to events of ten years ago. At Cardiff, Britain's elder statesman Winston Churchill is accorded a great reception and the freedom of the city. From his wisdom, the wartime premier who had predicted all too clearly the world's drift in 1936 again advises an anxious nation. This I will say that there is one simple guide in times of difficulty and that is to do what is right and what is honourable and to do one's duty. It is not only the most uh, proper thing to do but it is also in most cases the safest course to take. Um, yeah. There are many dangers in the modern world from which no country can save itself by flight. Yeah. Firm, steady, patient, policy will be supported no matter what government is in power, I am sure, by the great mass of the British nation. But in Italy, the Cold War, which has enslaved nations without the firing of a shot, bursts into sudden flame. The news that communist leader Togliatti has been shot while leaving the Italian parliament is the signal for strike mobs to move into action on a carefully ordered plan. Stern action is quickly taken by the Gaspari government, which sees the riots as communist inspired and designed to cut the country in two, separating the industrial north from Rome. As a practice operation, the riots served the communist purpose in frightening the timid. Without forceful government handling of the situation, Italy could be plunged overnight into civil war. Crowds surge along the streets around the hospital where Togliatti lies, awaiting news of his condition. Word that his operation has been successful calms those inflamed by genuine sympathy. The national strike collapses, but the threat remains.